Bible we say we stand on an empty grave we stand on an empty grave he has overcome he has overcome we stand on an empty grave we stand on an empty grave he has overcome he has overcome let's sing together we stand on an empty grave we stand on an empty grave he has overcome he has overcome say we stand on an empty grave we stand on an empty grave he has overcome he has over every demon shakes as we shout your praise, all the stones have rolled away. You have robbed the grave, so we celebrate your eternal victory. Every demon, every demon shakes as we shout your praise all the stones have rolled away you have robbed the grave so we celebrate your eternal victory oh shout oh Zion on an empty grave we dance on an empty grave he has overcome he has overcome we dance on an empty grave we dance on an empty grave he has overcome he has overcome we dance we dance on an empty grave on an empty grave, he has overcome, he has overcome, we dance on an empty grave, we dance on an empty grave, he has overcome, he has overcome. Oh, God. 
Reserved to give him glory. You're the only one amazing. You're the only one awesome. You're the only one holy. There is none like you, none above you, no getting around you. You're great. You're amazing. Yes, Lord, inexhaustible, indefatigable. God, you're immutable, ever living, ever forgiving. And we love the Lord. And we love our God. Would you just say to the Lord, you love him? And I'm emphatically in love with the Lord. Passionately in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. Wonderful God in the Holy Ghost. Now, Father, my prayer is found in the words of him. Come thou incarnate word. Gird up your mighty sword. Our prayer attempt. Come and your people bless. Come give your word success. Spirit of holiness upon us descend. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you oblige me for a moment? Would you oblige me for a moment? Honor will get you access while dishonor will get you dismissed. I live by a code of honor and I believe in a society that's filled with narcissism, uh, toxicity in that we are self-absorbed, self-explained, self-contained. This environment operates under a different administration. Love makes us honor others. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. Would you find somebody, look them in their eye, and tell them, I celebrate you. Come on, find somebody. Go and tell them, I celebrate you. I love you. I honor you. I believe God for you. I believe in you. I celebrate what the Lord is going to do in your life. This will be one of the greatest seasons of your life, and I will give you the down payment of praise, Lord. For what you're doing in somebody else. Yes. Love somebody else. Celebrate somebody else. Honor somebody else. Amen. Amen. We would be remiss if we didn't honor senior leadership. I want to honor the young pastor that you have. She looks like she's in her 30s so I can qualify you and tell you. I honor this young pastor. Could you act, could you help me celebrate Pastor Frazier? They're hiring pastors young now, praise the Lord. And of course, to the man in whom the Lord delights to honor, the man of God that has opened this door through the permission of your senior pastor, I want to honor Assistant Pastor Ferguson. God bless you. Could you help me celebrate him on his 28th birthday? Amen. Honor you. Call it like I see it. Amen. Amen. To our skilled musicians who has played mellifluously in the house of the Lord, those that serve uh, in the house of the Lord, God bless you. To all of this great beauty that I see 
if you know Robert Nelson, you'll know that this is the kind of church I want to come to every Sunday. My father was Pentecostal, hardline Pentecostal. My mother was Catholic, and I have this in my blood. I love this scenario. My, my, my place of dwelling looks like this, praise the Lord. Where I live looks like a little castle. And so we praise the Lord for this opportunity to stand in a beautiful temple. Um, for the sake of expedition, I am going to draw your attention to Luke, the 13th chapter. I am quite nervous um, because this is a very powerful crowd today. And I'm telling you, I have spoke for thousands three weeks ago, uh, two months ago. No, ooh, last month, last month, I spoke for a conference. I was the principal speaker. It was 3,500 people. I was shaking like this. But I'm more nervous here than I was there, <laughs> praise the Lord. So I'll do the best I can. Luke, the 13th chapter. For the sake of expedition, um, I'm going to read about four verses, and I will commence my reading at the sixth verse. Is that all right? Luke 13, let's begin reading at the sixth verse. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was once a man who had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went looking for figs on it. But he found nothing. So he said to his gardener, look, for three years I have been coming looking for figs on this tree and I haven't found anything. Cut it down. Why should it go on using up good soil? But the gardener said unto uh the gardener said unto the landowner, leave it alone. Just one more year. I will dig around it and put some manure on it. Then if the tree bears figs next year, so much the better. If not, then you can have it cut down. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Can somebody shout amen? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord for a brief moment, for the short time that I'm allowed to speak before you. I want to use for a subject, it's your time. It's your time. Can you touch yourself? Make this word personal and say, it's my time. Pastor Beverly, this word is for you. It's your time. Assistant pastor, this word is for you. It's your time. I, I did not honor Lady Crystal. Would you stand and show the people how pretty you are today? Amen. Honor you. Amen. Blessing of the Lord. Amen. Luke. All right. Now, there are, can I give you just four ways we look at scripture and then three points on this text and I'll be out. And I'll do this within 18 to 22 minutes. I'm scared of y'all. So I'll do this within 18 to 20 minutes and we'll go home. Amen. Now, one of the ways we look at scriptures, my brothers and sisters, is literally. Uh, there are some things that are no shades of gray. It's just simply black or white. Like, for instance, thou shall not kill. I don't have to go into the Greek and the Hebrew. I don't have to go into some heavy uh, search as to what that means. It's literal, thou shall not get. The, the whole of our salvific substratum hinges upon us believing that he died and was buried. He got up on the third day and now mediates before uh, man towards God. This is something that I believe is not a novel, a story, a folklore, but this is literal. If I cannot believe that, then I need to walk out this church today. There are some literals about scripture. Not only do we look at scripture literally, but then we look at scripture Hallelujah. Uh, let me say this. To develop our moral compass. To teach.
teach us how to act in a world that's spasmodic, if you will. And so we look at scripture lit uh, literally, but we also look at scripture to develop our behavior. Have you ever been at work and you were tempted to tell somebody off? And before you can get the words out of your mouth, I know everybody in Morning Star is holy, so they don't know about these things. But have you ever been tempted to tell that family member that you saw shopping uh, online, amen, but they owed you? money praise the Lord have you ever been tempted to say a few words but the word of the Lord came to you and said that you have to direct your tongue to speak love and not uh, spew out venom yes so the word of the Lord is not just something we look at literally but the word of the Lord is something that develops our behavior hallelujah I would be nasty because I'm under pressure but the word of the Lord corrects me so that my nastiness does not protrude and pollute my anointing all right so we look at the word literally we look at the word to develop our character but we also look look at uh, the word proleptically somebody say proleptically just a fancy word to let you know I'm in seminary. Amen. And they're not wasting time teaching me proleptically. And proleptically deals with the future. Proleptically deals with the fact that God is concerned about your tomorrow. God has orchestrated your tomorrow. As a matter of fact, you serve the God that will allow you to be sick today and before tomorrow be healed. Is there anybody here that knows that God knows how to bring your future into your present? Hallelujah. Have you ever gone to sleep crying? As a matter of fact, the scripture says weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. It's just that opportunity for God to bring you into a future that your present doesn't know yet. Amen. And so not only do we look at the word of the Lord literally, not only do we look at the word of the Lord to develop our character, but we also look at the word of the, word of the Lord proleptically, which deals with the future. But lastly, we look at the word of the Lord prophetically. Can somebody say prophetically? And this is important. This is important because there are layers in the word of the Lord that mandate pursuit. Mandate pursuit. You cannot just look uh, at the surface of what you're reading or hearing from God. It requires that you dig underneath the layers to see what is actually being expressed. There are layers to the prophetic. You have to study the word of the Lord to know that while you celebrate David being a giant killer, you have to study the word of the Lord to know that David and Goliath are actually related. You have to study the word of the Lord to see that the man that is standing before Joshua with his sword in his hand is a theophonic expression of God in, in the New Old Testament. You understand? So there is a layers to the Bible. There's layers to scriptures. And as a matter of fact, there are layers to you. Some people see you and your image but don't know you're more than your image. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I don't change my image to accommodate your prejudice. I'm a proud black man and I'm not trying to be anything else but me. You understand? If you don't like me, I give you the privilege to have your opinion but I'm glad for what God has made me. And I will not try to fit in your system or your modality to make you comfortable when I'm celebrating the layers that God has uh, enveloped me in. Is there anybody here that celebrates who you are right now? Almost done. <laughs> so this parable, almost done. This parable, Pastor Frazier, Pastor Ferguson, Lord have mercy, this parable is layered. And you have to dig deep to know that it's not literal. But it will accomplish a prophetic a word for us today. Look at this text. And it starts off this way. And a certain man planted a seed in a vineyard. I can preach that. I just won't do it today, sis, because you, you ain't prayed for me. A certain man planted a seed 
in the vineyard. That's my first message. A certain man planted a seed in the vineyard. Now this is important because a vineyard is a place that has been proved to work. A vineyard is a place that's right and flourishing and anytime you're looking for a place to invest you usually invest in the place that you know will work is is it just me i'm not going to take my hard earned money for just a risk no i'm going to look for some facts i'm going to look for some facts before i invest Yes, Lord. Almost done. And this man knows that the vineyard is ripe and robust, and he takes a fig seed. Uh -huh. Notice it's a fig seed in a vineyard. Not in a place where figs grow, but in a place where grapes grow. Because I know this will work. I got a question for all of the transparent, honest churchgoers. Have you ever planted a good seed in a bad place? Oh, Lord. Have you ever planted something and you just knew it was going to work? And sometimes it's not material, but it's emotional. You just said, you got, yeah, she got to be light skin. <laughs> he got to be dark skin. Yeah, she He's got to have this shape and he's got to have this kind of money and I just know it will work. But every now and then you will be disappointed because sometimes the place that you think will work does not work. And I'm just here to preach for those and preach to those uh, that have been embarrassed by your investment. I'm here to preach to those that got up in the morning and their body still wasn't healed. I've come to preach to those that have given their tithing and their offering and their bills somehow still struggle. I've come to preach to those that have done right but you feel like everything is going wrong. I've come to speak to the transition of your investment, Lord. The Bible says this man, this man, this hardworking man, this landowner, he has this vineyard. He plants figs knowing just like the grapes grows the figs will grow and for three whole years the three whole years now this is Jesus talking to a Palestinian people so it's a given that it might be more than just three years it actually may be five to six years because it's a given that you give three years anyway for something to grow but our uh, assistant pastor the text says for three years this man goes to the routine of looking for something to come out of what he is invested in. Lord, have mercy. Have you ever been there? Up in the morning, working, coming home to see something grow in your house. Coming Sunday after Sunday, expecting assistant pastor for a residual, all to find that nothing grows. And the text says that he has grown so frustrated that he says to his gardener, let me cut this tree down. Have you ever gone so tired of tolerating that you start terminating? Lord have mercy. And I'm going to speak real to you today because relationally we suffer because we know how to be an executioner, not an administrator. Lord have mercy. Relationally, our families and our relationships and our, and our, our, our harvest struggles because we know how to cut stuff up, but we don't know how to put things back together. Yes. Relationally, we know, you know, church people tend to be good executioners. I can prove it to you. It was an executioner at the cross. They were a bunch of church people. Yeah. Church people know how to cut things up, but powerful prophetic people know how to administrate. My first point today, my first point to you is never bring an axe to where you need a shovel. My first point, Pastor, if it makes any kind of sense, Assistant Pastor, is stop bringing an axe to where you need to have a shovel. 
An axe is utilized to cut stuff down, but a shovel is utilized to turn stuff over. You understand what I'm saying? And for your embarrassment, for your pain, for your struggle, for your lack of harvest, God says don't quit. Uh, you got to learn to look at what's not growing and have another initiation. Turn that soil with a shovel. Is there anybody here that's willing to leave church this morning dropping your axe and picking up a shovel? Yes. Every now and then I've come to prayer with an axe and I told the Lord the only way this can work is if I cut it up. The only thing, it, 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 the only way this can work is if I cut, because this has not yielded for me the produce I'm expecting. And I'm embarrassed by the investment. Let me cut. But there is a gardener. Somebody say gardener. The gardener, the word gardener is actually an Aramaic word which means to cultivate. And a gardener does not look at what's not growing. The gardener has decided what could grow as a, work of, as a result of his work ethic. Look at this text. This gardener says, wait, wait, don't cut it down. <clears throat> Every now and then you got to tell yourself, drop the axe. Dro drop that axe. Some people have bad attitudes because stuff ain't working. And their attitude is so present that their, their optimism has died. Drop that axe. Not everybody is an abuser. Drop the axe. Not everybody hates you. Drop the bad axe. Not everybody is against you. Drop that ass. If, if you can't trust nobody, the problem is more with you than others. I want to be honest. I'm very scared of people that talk about, I don't trust nobody. In their mind, they may think that's a safeguard, but in their confession, it's really an indication of that person. Because if you don't trust others, it's possible that we should not trust you. Because a person that does not give trust cannot expect to receive trust. Almost done. All right, so he said, cut it down. This cultivator now, this gardener says, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Let me deal with this matter. Now, I want to deal with that for just one minute. Because to cultivate means I know how to intercede. And this really text is really dealing with intercession. The job of an intercessor is to cultivate. And uh, yeah, when you pray, you should not just pray for results. You should pray for strategy. That is the beauty of praying because when you really get in contact with God, he's going to give you a strategy on how to get out of it. When you really get in contact with God, it's not just about thundering and lightning. It's about methods. And prayer will give you a method to deal with the mess in your life. And I know everybody here is rich. Everybody has their bills paid. Everybody has a good old-fashioned life. But there's somebody in church today that was saying to themselves, Lord, if you don't give me a strategy, I'm going to drown in pain. Help me to get out of this mess. This gardener, this gardener, almost done. I promise you, I'm looking at the clock. I got eight more minutes. This gardener, Pastor Frazier, this gardener says, wait, prayer has given me a strategy. I hope you put that in your note. First note is don't bring axes to where you need shovels. God is not looking for you to terminate. He's looking for you to activate. Don't bring an axe. You need a shovel. You need somebody who can work the ground. Now, second point, look at the text. This man has a strategy. He said, wait, before you cut this thing down, let me dig again. I want to tell you, you're not cursed. Your ground is not cursed. What you need to do is try it again. Dig again. And this next level of miracles that God wants to release to his people is not for the lazy. 
It's not for the lethargic. It's not for those that sit around here contemplating how to be God in life. But it's for those that know how to obey him again and try it one more time. And I want to preach for somebody in this house that feels it's not working. If you can just lift your hands and say, Lord, I know this ground looks cursed, but there's a miracle in this ground. And I'm going to dig and turn over the ground till what is not growing has another opportunity. Somebody shout, I'm going to dig one more time. Almost done. He said, wait, wait. He said, wait, don't cut it down. Let me dig again. Try it again. Pray about it again. The other thing is, now, time is not validated until a plan is implemented. You don't have access to more time until you first agree to the method. You, I don't want to give, God does not want to give people more time just to soak up and absorb and not implement the strategy he gave you. He says, wait, this is my plan. I want to dig again. Second thing, he said, let me dung. Let me dung. Somebody say dung. Now, I know most of you are city people. And you live in the rich fields of Westchester. And y'all are not from the country or the south. Like my grandmother who came from King's Tree, South Carolina. Pastor Beverly, but have you ever heard of dung? <laughs> you know, and that's a real biblical word, dung. But we have modern words for it too. Like when my mother said, uh, Robert, do you have to do a number one or a number two? The two is synonymous with dung. You understand? I heard my cousins arguing and, and somebody said something about doo-doo. You are not, I'm just trying to make it very plain. And for all of you academically elite defecation, mm -hmm, compost, you understand. I'm trying to hit all surfaces because you're all intellectual in here. You understand. Dong, number two, hallelujah, the stinky stuff. Hallelujah. He said, let, no, wait, wait, wait. There's a, this is, this, this, this might be considered oxymoronic. Because are you telling me I do everything to pray the doo-doo away? And in this text it says I need to utilize it. Are you telling me that the prayers I pray to get out of the mess are some things that I have to reconsider again? Because often God wants to use the mess. Lord, have mercy. I know you don't want the dung. I know you don't want the mm, stinky place. But some of the greatest miracles of the Bible come out of a mess. You understand? And you, you learn how to develop when God has you in a messy place. And I, I heard, I heard my coworker, he was so profound. He was an Epicurean. He's probably a philosopher. He's brilliant. You know what he said? On the lunch break, he said, Robert, you cannot turn number two into perfume. He's brilliant. He didn't use those words. He didn't use those words. No, he didn't use those words. I promise you, my brother, he didn't use those words. He said, you cannot turn number two into perfume. And I said, wow, that was so profound, I almost walked away in agreement. Until I realized that this man did not go to theology school, and neither did he go to uh, science class. Because I am a uh, perfume kind of, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a perfume. I got more colognes than I do money. You understand? I just bought cologne last night. For a little bottle of cologne, 400, brother, let me tell you something, I'll never be poor, at least smell poor, because I believe in good hygiene, hallelujah. But I happened to read the labels, and it says this was made out of bitter, 
and it was made out of roses. Wait a minute, wait. So that man, in effect, was wrong. Although I can't turn the element of number two into perfume, if I take number two and put it on top of a seed, it will grow roses which become perfume. You understand what I'm saying? And I want you to know some of the mess you're trying to get out of is actually an invitation to the extraordinary. And I need somebody in this house that will admit that you're in a financial mess, an emotional mess, a relational mess, a ministerial mess to praise God because he's going to turn what stoke into something that perfumes. Open your mouth and give him a shout in the building. Oh no, I'm good. I'm done. Point one, don't bring, I don't care how embarrassed you are. I don't care how long it's taking. I don't care how bad it broke you. Don't bring an axe to where you need to have a shovel. There's some things that God says you ain't got to cut up, but you've got to put your back into it and work. You understand? You got to turn the soil again. Stop looking for rewards and stop implementing good work ethic. Uh -huh. Second, you got to learn that sometimes a number two experience is an invitation to an extraordinary life. I've come to preach to the transition of this ministry and tell you God is going to bring a miracle out of the mess. I need you to lead church. Going home, walking up into your problem and say, God's going to bring a miracle out of this mess. I need you to look at your finances, look at your mortgage, look at your college tuition, look at something in your house that's really jacked up and messed up, and say, he's going to bring a miracle out of it. I need you to touch your body, something that's physically broken, and say, God's going to bring a miracle out of this mess. All right. My last point, you, the embarrassed landowner who was expecting something to grow and was operating in anger because he was trying to execute what God wanted to live, says he has to submit to the word of the Lord. He has to admit that the counsel of God is greater than his intellect. Sometimes God does not validate your emotions. He emphasizes his word. I know you're right to think that way because you're more logical, but I'm so glad that we serve an anti-logical God. Aren't you glad that God does not consult the mayor before he blesses you? Aren't you glad that God does not have to uphold science before he gives you a miracle? Aren't you glad that God does not go to the judge to ask the judge for permission to look up a code to bless you? But whatever the Lord says he wants to do is really something that nobody can uh, God adjudicate. Here it is. Don't bring an axe to where you need to bring a shovel. Turn that thing. Don't cut it. Second, stop trying to push away the mess and embrace the mess. Your transition is in your embrace. He's going to use what stuck to become something that fertilizes something that grows and flourishes. There's a miracle coming out of your mess and you gotta dig you got a dung. But here's my last point. I know you're glad it's over. You also got to give yourself some days. You got to, you got, you, did you hear what I said? You, you got to give yourself some time. Right in the text. Don't cut it down. Just give me one more year. Somebody say one more year. Somebody say one more year. I, did you? Somebody say one more year. Say one more year like you know your life depends on it. One more year. Say one more year like you know your ministry needs it. Come on, say it. Say one more year like you're not satisfied with what you have right now. Come on, say it. Say one more year like you believe your next year will be greater than this year. 
Can somebody say one more year? Pastor, here's the text. He said, let me dig, let me dunk, but give me one more year. When I realized something, God gives you time not, not only to prove that you were right, but God gives you more time to prove that others were wrong. He gives you time to show somebody that thought that this tree would not grow again. To see what it will be next year. And I need somebody that enjoyed 23 to move into praise and ecstatic ex expectation. Because you know 24 is going to be greater than what your last year was. I need somebody say, I thank God for this year. But by this time next year, all of my bills will be paid. By this time next year, all of my family will be saved. By this time next year, I'll have the house I want. Stand to your feet. I'm done. It's your time. If you can stand to your feet, it's your time. It's your time. It's, we started this text, my brother. We started this text in a funeral because from verses six to eight, this thing looked like it was gonna be a funeral. I was gonna preach the eulogy of a good tree. I was gonna preach that there are possibilities but people's impatience will try to terminate what God wants to be triumphant. And the Bible says that this gardener goes into intercession for the life of a tree that needs prophetic insight. You just need somebody to see what God sees about you. You don't want to be surrounded by people who celebrate your past but don't see your potential. One of the most hateful things that you need, that you don't need, is friends without revelation. You need somebody that can see into your tomorrow. And this little prayer is for those that are like this landowner, tired, but you know there's more. Lift your hands. Pray with us. I come to speak to your health, to your mind. You're frustrated by your past. You're frustrated by your pain. Pastor, can I just stand here? I'm sorry. You're frustrated. And the Lord wants me to tell you that it's your time. He wants me to share with you that it's not too late for a comeback wants me to tell some of you that are more discouraged than encouraged that the best is still yet to come and the things that you've envisioned are not worthy to go into the ground to die but they're going to grow and live Father let those that are in morning star see the brightness of your coming and the brightness of what you're doing in their lives. Father, make them overcomers. Let them not yield to the pressures of compromise, but let them spring forth. I will do a new thing, and it shall spring forth. I will make a way in the wilderness, and I will bring rivers to your desert, because I'm the God that has decided to bless you I speak over families I speak over their future I speak over their health and I speak the commanded blessing of the Lord to fall upon let fresh revelation be upon the men and women of God let fresh insight encouragement be upon the servants of God inundate them with health but refresh them for movement Father, I speak over this pastor, the refreshing of the Lord, the victory of God. 
that lets us see this tree living not worthy of termination I give you glory I give you honor you're going to live to see it happen because it's your time would you give God praise for the word of the Lord would you give God I'm done. would you give God praise for the word of God say it's my time can you walk out of the aisle and walk up and down and say it's my time somebody take a walk into your new place it's my time be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you